Hello, this is a general psychology mini lecture on experiments and research ethics by Ian McFarlane. So as we've been going through the class, we spent some time talking about some of the commonly used research methods in psychology. For example, we talked about things like case studies, naturalistic observations, surveys, and correlational research. The topic of today's mini lecture is going to be experiments, including how to set them up correctly, and we're going to talk a little bit about research ethics as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about is basically what is an experiment and what's beneficial about it. So an experiment is considered the gold standard of research, and it's considered the gold standard because it's the only way that we can examine how one variable causes another variable to change. Okay, we talked briefly before about independent and dependent variables. So you manipulate the independent variable in order to see if there's a change in the dependent variable. The reason we can make cause and effect arguments with an experiment is we use tight experimental control. We try to hold as many things as possible constant between one group and another. Therefore, anything that is different between the two groups, we can say is due to the thing that we manipulated between them. This is the only legitimate way to make cause and effect arguments. Okay, and that's the chief advantage of doing an experiment and why it's considered the gold standard. When conducting an experiment, you control as many outside influences as possible. With these influences ruled out, you're able to make conclusions that the only reason why two groups are different is the one thing you allowed to be different between them, the independent variable that you manipulated. Other variables that could be having an impact on the dependent variable are either controlled, meaning that you have uh, set them to be constant across all groups of your study, or they're considered confounds. Confounding variables are variables that you are not controlling and not measuring that could have an effect on your experiment. For example, let's say you developed a new intervention that you think will help kids gain self-esteem. So for one group of kids, you deliver this uh, intervention and you measure their self-esteem uh, afterward. In another group of kids, you do nothing. So they're not exposed to any treatment. Okay, that's your control group. Okay, afterwards you see if the group that receives your intervention has higher self-esteem than the group that didn't. A confounding variable could be gender. If there are boys, all boys in one group and all girls in another, it may be that you've found gender differences in self-esteem, not differences based on your intervention. So while experiments try to eliminate outside influences, you have to make sure they're designed well enough ahead of time to actually do that job. Now, if you continue on and be a psych major, you'll take uh, research methods in which you will spend a lot of time talking about how to design good research studies and how to um, deal with potential problems that could come up along the way. Now, even experiments aren't perfect. Okay, there are some disadvantages to running an experiment also. The first is that it may not be generalizable. Or, in other words, you may put so many controls on the experiment so that you're able to really rule out alternative explanations, and that's a good thing. But at the same time, you may change the situation uh, so much from reality that you're not able to generalize your findings from the research situation to everyday situations. So if we go back to the example of a new method for promoting self-esteem in kids. If in your research lab, when you're conducting the study, you only allow kids to come in who are positive and are encouraging to others, then your study might show that your uh, self-esteem intervention actually works quite well. But out in, if you try to deliver this in schools, for, for example, you wouldn't be able to just pick the students who were very uh, pro-social and willing to encourage others. You'd have to include everyone. So when you start to do this same program out in schools, in the, the real world as opposed to the, the controlled environment of your research lab, you may find that the, the intervention no longer works. Another disadvantage of experiments is sometimes it's just too unethical to do. 
Okay, if you're going to put people into uh, conditions, one versus another, you may not be able to do that ethically. Uh, for example, uh, if you take the smoking and cancer, for a long time the cigarette companies were able to deny that smoking caused cancer because there weren't any experiments that showed conclusively in humans that smoking would increase the, the likelihood of developing lung cancer or other assorted cancers. The reason why there wasn't that research is because it would be unethical. We can't take a group of people and assign half of them to smoke a pack a day for 20 years and the other half to not smoke at all. Uh, it would be unethical because we may very well be doing harm to the people who've been assigned to smoke. Okay, another example is we can't take a group of kids, assign half of them to be abused, and half of them to grow up without abuse. Again, you're doing harm to participants, uh, which is not ethical. So while experiments are considered the gold standard, they may not always be the best choice when it comes to trying to select the best research method for your research question. Now when we're talking about experiments, we always talk about the experimental or the treatment group and we compare that to the control group. So the experimental group is the group that is exposed to the manipulation. Okay, so in our example of self-esteem building, it would be the group that is given the, the self-esteem promotion materials or workshop or whatever it is. Okay, and then the control group is a group that doesn't get any manipulation. So the control group is always left as is. Okay, now there are some situations where leaving people as is would be unethical. For example, if you're studying methods for treating depression, you can't assign half the people to get this me new method of treating depression and half the people to get nothing uh, because it's dangerous and could be harmful to participants to not get treatment for the depression. So sometimes control group gets what's called uh, treatment as usual. So they may get uh, a type of treatment that is already shown to work. You're trying then in your research study to show that your new method is as good or better than what's already been established to work. What the control group does is it helps us rule out things like, for the depression example, people just get better over time on their own. Or for the self-esteem promotion example, we would be able to rule out the idea that kids just get more self-esteem as they grow older. It doesn't matter what you do. Okay, because the tr control group doesn't get any manipulation, we can say that uh, anything we notice in the experimental group that's different must be due to the manipulation. Okay, now the question that comes up is, you need to break your sample into an experimental and control group, but how do you do that? How do you decide who gets the treatment versus who gets the control? The best way to do this is random assignment. Okay, you want to randomly assign people to different uh, conditions as, uh, whenever you possibly can. The, the reason for this is it eliminates systematic bias before a study begins. One of my pet peeves is when people talk about random assignment making the groups equal um, because that just isn't true. Some textbooks even say that random assignment creates equal groups. Okay, That's not true because it's just impossible to have completely equal groups ahead of time. For example, let's say I had 10 people and I was going to put them on basketball teams, so two teams of five. Now all else being equal, uh, it's an advantage in basketball to be taller. So let's say I was going to flip a coin for each person and if it was heads they were on one team and tails they were on the other. Okay, So I could go through and I could conceivably randomly uh, assign the teams and end up with the five tallest people on one team and the five shortest people on the other. Okay, clearly these are not equal teams, okay, but they were randomly assigned. Okay, what the random assignment does is it ensures that no one was systematically more likely to be in one group than the other. So what it does is eliminate a potential bias. Okay, we want our experiments and all of our research really to be as unbiased as possible. The reason that a non-random assignment creates bias is that if you, as a researcher, are, are assigning people to groups, or if you're using some rule to assign people to groups, okay, factors that could be related to the dependent variable 
uh, could be interfering. So let's say I wanted to do research on uh, a new method to prepare for exams. So I wanted to see if people who used my method would score higher on a, let's say, math test than uh, a group of students who wasn't exposed to my method. So I may get, uh, get all set up and have the first 10 people who arrive for my experiment go to my study group and the next 10 people who show up to go to the control group. Now it may be that the people who showed up first uh, did so because of some personality trait. Maybe they're more conscientious, they're more punctual, they pay more attention to detail in terms of being able to get the directions to the, the location of the experiment. Um, and those factors that they differ on may be related to how well they do on the math test. So it may not be my uh, manipulation per se, it may be more of a factor of I let this bias sneak into my research design. Okay, uh, random assignment is so important that without random assignment, it's not a true experiment. Okay, a true experiment requires an independent variable that's manipulated by the researcher and random assignment. Okay, so remember that random sampling is important to decide whether or not you can generalize the uh, results of your study back to the population. Random assignment lets you really decide if there is, uh, you can make a cause and effect argument. Okay, sometimes we want to study variables that we don't have a choice. Uh, we're not allowed to randomly assign people. For example, let's say I wanted to study sex differences in personality traits. Okay, I can't randomly assign a person to be either male or female. Okay, so I would have to just take the people who are already male and put them in one group and the people who are already female and put them in another. Okay, I also can't randomly assign people to be short or tall. I can't assign uh, racial backgrounds or there's a whole bunch of things that I can't randomly assign. Okay, this doesn't mean we can't do experiments, but we have to call them what's called quasi-experiments. Okay, so when we use intact groups, groups that weren't randomly assigned, we call that a quasi-experiment, not a true experiment. Okay, and you technically can't make causal arguments based on quasi-experiments, but you can still have, it gives you more confidence that it may be uh, an effect due to the independent variable than things like just doing a correlation study. So now that we've talked through the major research methods used in psychology, I want to give you five questions to ask anytime you are reading psychological research. Okay, so anytime you read about research in the news or online, or even when you read a journal article, you need to ask yourself these five critical questions. Okay, the first question you need to ask is, how did they operationalize their variables? Okay, so what were the operational definitions? Okay, the researchers had to decide how to measure each of their variables. Like we talked about in class, this definition is very important and you need to be able to tell how did they decide to measure it. The second question is how did they select their participants? Okay, did they do random selection? Did they ask for volunteers? Did they uh, just take people they found on the street? You know, what was their process? Unless the process was a random process, then they can't generalize their findings back to the population. Okay, you can only generalize to po the population if you randomly sample. Next question is how do they assign participants to groups? Okay, this is especially important if they try to make any kind of cause and effect argument. Okay, but you want to see were they assigned randomly? Did they have to use intact groups? Um, what was going on there? The fourth question is, does the method used allow for causal claims? Okay, uh, you need to ask yourself, is this a true experiment or not? Okay, the only way to make causal claims is if there's a true experiment. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see headlines in the news that are really misleading. Um, you know, they say things like um, going to private school increases uh, students' IQ. Okay, well, in order to make a claim like that, they'd have to do a uh, randomly assigned study, which means that they'd have to take a whole bunch of preschool kids and randomly assign some of them to go to private school and some of them to go to public school. 
Okay, I don't know of any studies that have actually been able to do that. So they can't actually make those claims. Now, if they did that, great, look at their research, and you should probably send that research article to me so I can read it. Um, but in general, you have to be really careful to look for causal claims and make sure they use an appropriate method. Okay, and lastly, when they're writing up their conclusions, when they're talking about how their research applies to, the, um, to society, are they generalizing it to the right population? Okay, so you have to make sure that they're, they're not stretching their conclusions beyond who it's supposed to apply to. Be especially careful with this because a lot of research is conducted on college students, but then sometimes researchers or journalists get excited and make conclusions about all kinds of people who aren't college students. Okay, make sure you can answer these five questions for any bit of research you read, and any, if you can't answer any of these questions, uh, that calls into question whether or not you can really trust the results that are reported. The last thing I want to cover briefly is research ethics. Okay, we'll be talking about ethical research throughout the semester, and psychology has a great history of doing lots and lots of very ethical research, but unfortunately, as a field, psychology has also been involved in a number of highly unethical research situations. Um, your book has several examples of unethical research, so make sure you take a look at those. Because we've made mistakes in the past as a field, we have to make sure that we are paying extra attention when we are designing our research today. So to that end, um, we have what are called institutional review boards. This is a group of people who are trained specifically to monitor research ethics. They're typically professional researchers, oftentimes professors. And they, anytime you want to collect data on humans, you have to get their approval before you can start. In psychology, the American Psychological Association puts out an official code of ethics that psychologists need to adhere to. Um, now, IRBs actually are conducted for any research that, that involves humans, not just psycho psychological research. Um, so they don't follow explicitly just the APA guidelines. Um, there are other guidelines that are federally mandated uh, by the government. Uh, so for some example guidelines is that doing uh, research with humans, you need to obtain what's called informed consent. Informed consent means that ahead of time, before the person agrees to be in your study or declines, uh, he or she is informed of all the different risks and benefits um, for that person in the research study. So if there's any potential things that could affect a person negatively by being in the study, they need to be informed. Also, if there are benefits to the person for being in the study, they need to be informed. Uh, for example, if you are conducting a study where they're going to put you under uh, stressful situations to see how you respond, they would need to tell you ahead of time that you're going to be put in a stressful situation. Uh, the reason is you want to protect participants from harm. Okay, we don't want our research to cause harm to people. Uh, we need to conduct our research in ways that minimizes the risk uh, and maximizes the reward. Uh, when you're doing ethical research, it's important that you have to protect confidentiality. So your identity as a research participant needs to be protected. Okay, now sometimes in order to, for our research experiments to work correctly, we have to employ a little bit of deception. For example, we may not say in our informed consent that there's going to be a memory test at the end of the study. This is because we want to see how memory works in natural settings, and we don't want you to pay extra attention to trying to memorize something when you wouldn't normally do that. Uh, there also sometimes if we do research on stereotypes or uh, prejudices, we don't want to tip off people that that's what we're asking about uh, because then we might get socially desirable responses, people just saying what they're supposed to say rather than how they really think or feel. If there's any deception at all in your study, you need to provide complete debriefing at the end of the study. So you need to tell the participants everything that happened in the study and why you did it. Um, we don't want people leaving uh, research studies feeling like they've been tricked. Uh, so it's important that you explain this to people in a way that they can understand uh, and apologize for misleading them if applicable. So that wraps up this mini lecture. Uh, we covered 
uh, experimental design. We talked about the importance of random assignment. Next, we went over five important questions to ask yourself whenever you're reading research. And then we talked briefly about the Institutional Review Board and its role in protecting participants uh, who are helping out researchers by being in their study. If you have any questions about the material covered here, I encourage you to come to office hours or to shoot me an email uh, and I can make sure that we, we fill in any gaps. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in class.